Social workers need quantitative research skills, and it comes from my own um, practice back in the day. I can remember thinking um, this thought, hey, wait a minute, I thought I was a clinical social worker. Um, <clears throat> and that thought has its roots in my MSW program. Um, the one thing that I clearly remember about my uh, research program my research class in my MSW program was that some of the faculty, maybe quite a number of them, seemed to be of the mind that it was a necessary evil. Something that was required by the Council on Social Work Education. And I remember the single semester of research focused on how to be effective consumers of research. Being able to recognize a good research article from a bad research article. And uh, other than that, we also designed uh, something called a single case design project, which we did on ourselves. So it was pretty research light. Um, now, now there were some research skills that were more extensive, and they were available to those who were enrolled in a uh, administrative track. So here at UMKC, of course, you know we have this uh, advanced journalist perspective, and um, so. Uh, we don't have an administrative track. So that's why why you get what you sometimes feel like is a little bit of an overdose of research here in our program. Actually, I wanted to enroll in a program evaluation course, but I was not allowed to do that because I wasn't in the administrative tract. And um, um, so that was kind of sad. So, Well, I get my MSW. I move forward in my life. Um, I didn't grieve not having research. Um, and in my first post MSW job was at a community support program. Now this was during the height of the deinstitutionalization movement. People with uh, serious and persistent mental illnesses were being brought out of the large state hospitals, kind of in mass. So we were we were tasked with finding them and places to stay in the community and finding ways to support them. So and this was all based on um, something that was all the rage at the time, still is popular, uh, strengths-based case management <clears throat> with the severe and persistently mentally ill. Uh, it was reasonably well documented then and supported, certainly by the branch of uh, county mental health services where I worked in. I don't think it hurt that they were getting a buttload of money from the state to do it. So, so anyway, life was good. You know, it was, it was busy, quite busy, but good. Um, you know, we, we had a plan. Everybody seemed to know what we were doing, you know, what we're supposed to be doing. The clients we were serving were, you know, fairly homogenous. Uh, you know, people with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, a few other kind of oddball psychotic disorders were thrown in there. So, um, and our goals were simple to keep people out of the state hospital. Then things changed. <clears throat> the success of the community support program lent itself to providing greater challenges. Um, you know, we we experienced what I think they would call now mission creep. Um, the political will then was not really focused on doing good things for people with psychotic disorders. I think people were just fine that we were doing good things for people with psychotic disorders. But really, the big deal was money, reducing hospitalization days. So our admission criteria began to change. So gone were the days when diagnosis was 
central to admission criteria. I mean, initially, community support programs only allowed people that had schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression with psychotic features into the program. That was it. That was it. Uh, then word from on high changed all of that. Admission criteria started moving towards frequency and duration of state, and then really later, any psychiatric hospital admission. Initially, our program um, <clears throat> uh, focused on a, a wave of young adults cl clients who were, for lack of a better word, graduating from state hospitalization for the sole reason that they had reached their majority. So these people were primarily in hospitals because they had some kind of a conduct disorders and their parents had voluntarily committed them to the state hospital. Now they set up a special sub-program um, uh, that kind of tracked these younger clients and, um, uh, and it worked well. You know, they, they, there was some planning that went into this. There was some special programming. Um, uh, but however, when, we, when we, we, we moved from just state hospitalization, deinstitutionalization, to including private hospitalization, um, the community support program started receiving more and more uh, the, uh, this steady stream of people who had personality disorders. And primarily, um, and really most di difficult to treat was those with um, uh, borderline personality disorder. Now, BPD, D, as it's often called, uh, is one of those cluster B personality disorders. And it's marked by impulsivity, labile affect, a pattern of unstable relationships and self image, um, particularly an intense fear of abandonment. Um, and, and most difficult for the community support program just to deal with and, and really staff everywhere um, and society, families, everybody to deal with is that borderline personality uh, disorder to clients commonly engage in self-mutilization and suicidal behaviors. Um, <clears throat> Unlike the young adult programs, there was no special program set up. They just kind of started showing up, trickling in from outpatient offices, um, even though we claimed that they were dumped on us. Now you'll hear a lot of stuff about borderline personality disorder clients and how tough they are to work with, and there is some truth to that. Uh, but in reality, I really ended up enjoying working with BPD clients. Um, while there are a lot of challenges associated with that and there was a lot of certainly heartaches um, uh, with this disorder. Overall, you knew you were helping to keep people safer, and um, uh, so um, the um, the challenges, uh, the heartache, the, um, the 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 losses were I think well worth worth it uh, when you kind of step back and realize the amount of good you were doing for people. <clears throat> Well, we started getting these folks, and you know, I'm an ethical social worker, and um, um, I, I, back then as now, social work practice needed to be supported by evidence, um, and it didn't take us long working with the, the BPD population to realize that the same approach that we had used for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, it just wasn't effective with these new clients. Uh, <clears throat> And in fact, it seemed as if uh, maybe what we were doing was having the opposite effect. So I and really some other people on my team uh, began looking for some new approaches, but it was, I think, I think it was mostly me. I was a clinician on our team, so it was really my job to, to find uh, these new approaches. So think back to the day. This was the 80s. The 80s. <laughs> um, the internet was not really readily available. We didn't. We didn't. We did not even have computers. Uh, um, um, this wasn't the 80s. This was the 90s, Bob. <clears throat> the internet was not readily available. Um, um, now I did have a personal computer at home, um, and. Uh, we had just recently received a, um, a um, 
desktop computer uh, in some of the outpatient offices, including mine as a clinician. Uh, uh, so, so anyway, using my computer at home, I was able to uh, search KU's Kermit database uh, via a 300 baud modem. <laughs> Boy, um, um, <clears throat> and we had a small library in the outpatient office. However, they, these these things weren't indexed, so it was real real difficult to 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 find specific practices for borderline personality. We also worked with uh, you know their previous therapists to find out what worked, you know get that practice wisdom sort of a thing. But you know, in reality, if they knew what had worked, uh, or if they knew what would work and were doing it. They wouldn't have been sent over to to us, so um, no, would they? <laughs> uh, it, it, think about my 300 baud Mobin. This is a, an aside here. You know, today my Google Fiber, three million five hundred thousand plus times faster than that original 300 baud modem. My gosh, uh, there it is. That's that's an actual uh, Tandy 1,300 baud modem board. I had to install that myself. It was those were the days of computers, folks. <clears throat> so where did I do some of my best practices investigation? Was it bookstores? Some of you younger folks might ask, what is a bookstore? <laughs> um, well there were buildings back in the day that were dedicated just to selling books. And ironically, a place that I stopped in, well, they sold coffee too. That's why, also why I stopped in there a lot. Um, a place called Borders. You get Borders and Borderline. <clears throat> and they had a section on, on mental health issues. And um, uh, so I would browse that occasionally. And I come across a couple of books on treating borderline personality disorder. Lo and behold, um, the one that I liked was called Cognitive Behavioral Treatment of Borderline Personality Disorder um, by a gal named Marsha Linehan, who was just completed a series of, uh, of uh, research uh, projects on borderline personality disorders. Uh, using this method and published the treatment manual from that. And then I took that book with me off to uh, Tortola to um, study. Actually, I did. Uh, we were, I was going on vacation anyway, so it gave me a little light reading. Um, so anyway, when I got back from vacation and actually read the book, um, I convinced our, our team that we should go ahead and, and um, jump on the DBT bandwagon as it was starting to be called, dialectical behavior therapy. Now Marshall Linehan, the developer, has, was just, you know she just happened to be coming to Minningers, um, which at the time was in Topeka. Um, so several of us went to trainings over there and we were kind of off to the races setting up uh, as faithful as we possibly could an implementation of DBT. And uh, <clears throat> You think of, of the systems perspective, uh, where you change something somewhere, it changes everything everywhere. Well, that is um, um, uh, DBT. You, you implement DBT properly, and its systems change. It's, it's um, as well as client changing. You, you you change the way the system interacts with the client. You change the way the therapist interacts with the client. You change the way the therapist interacts with the system. So. Uh, it was kind of radical at the time. Um, uh, DBT theory held that certain behaviors by the system, treatment system, including, you know, including families and, uh, and and social networks, reinforced and sometimes worsened the self-harm behaviors um, of individuals with DBT. Um, now some departments, um, they weren't willing to change um, what they were doing. Um, you know, somebody yells, hey, I'm going to kill myself, and, um, and they're, they just, you know, ah, <laughs> haul them off, you know, give them to somebody else is essentially what they were doing. Ah, you're going to kill yourself, I'll take you over to the hospital, let somebody else deal with them. So, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, the, the change was often resisted 
um, you know, we, we, we wanted to change things. We would talk to um, uh, local hospitals um, uh, about people who would show up at their door. So initially, some people resisted. Fortunately, our emergency services quickly realized that th there was something to this, and they got on board. So, since it is easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, um, you know, this, this DBT really was kind of a bottom-up implementation. So, so it was it was really uh, us clinical staff plus case managers um, trying to find something that that could work for this new um, um, crop of of clients that we we seem to have had, and uh, it, it wasn't approved by the clinical director of the mental health center or the agency director. Uh, could get that straight. No. Though our local clinical and agency directors were accepting of what we were doing. Um, there was no opposition. They certainly knew what we were doing and I was the clinical clinical director, I mean the clinic clinician on our team um, and the clinician on the other team that adopted DBT. We were on board with it and we were trained in it. So, so as, as we moved along we began to hear grumblings coming from above. Um, now politics, you know, you read in Ruben and Babby about politics and research. Oh gosh, you talk about politics in, in, in a community support program versus the outpatient offices. It's, you know, you think Republicans and Democrats and Washingtons <laughs> can't get along. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the tension between the outpatient offices and the community support program was, was always palpable. You know, we, we were getting, and I understand, you know, it all has to do with money. Well, not all. But you know, we were we were initially getting a lot of money from the state uh, to do our community support program, which would eventually mean that there would be monies that the outpatient office was used to getting that would start to come over to the community support program. So they could see the handwriting on the wall. Um, so they asked for us to um, review our program. You know, so while the official DBT program. Uh, the official reason for reviewing a DBD program was that we need evidence was that it works. The politics and the rumor was that there was embarrassment in the outpatient offices that the, the community support program, these 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 stepchildren of the mental health system, were being successful um, <laughs> with these borderline personality clients, where they had not. Um, of course, with the exception of perhaps Martha. Uh, no one ever rubbed that in. <laughs> well, maybe a few of us did, but no, actually we didn't. Uh, well, Martha did, but uh, um, <clears throat> we, um, you know, we we were we were just doing a new practice. We didn't we didn't think of them as bad therapists or anything like that. Now, we kind of shot back and said, you know, well, we've been trained in this. It's an evidence-based practice. What's the deal? Well, that wasn't good enough for them, whoever they are, the clinical director and the uh, agency director. Um, um, we may have had our ducks in a row, but we didn't have our ducks in the line. So, <clears throat> nice poster there. They need proof. Um, you, know, you know, the fact is, at the time, um, our, our, our training certificates would have been good enough in a court of law. You know the literature. You know the proof. This literature of DBT as an evidence-based practice. Our training. Uh, you know, if we got hauled into court, a judge would have looked at that and said, "Oh, you're following reasonable custom customary practice, and you, and you're not practicing outside of your skill set." So they would have been fine with it. But you know those those hurt egos in the out, out patient office. We understood maybe they didn't want us to f succeed, uh, and they didn't figure that we would pass muster. So. They needed evidence. We needed to produce evidence that DBT was working in our program with our clients, or the powers to be were going to forbid us from doing it any longer. So, so what were we going to do? We needed evidence. So, um, and of the two clinicians or team leaders of teams that were involved, three, three clinicians and three team leaders that were primarily involved with uh, the DBT program, they all kind of looked at me as the, quote, they used to call me that DBT guru. I mean, good God. And they call me the computer guru now at the office and, you know, I can barely turn the thing on. So, 
they looked to me to help. So I didn't know what to do. But I did contact our data managers in IT, and, and they were, in fact, very helpful. You know, I, I asked for and got all the information that I wanted. You know, I wanted the number of days of hospitalization. I wanted the number of days of respite days. I wanted the number of suicide attempts, self-harm attempts. All these things that we've been kind of checking off on these little forms were being were being put into computers someplace. And, um, you know, how much people were working, going to school, you know, participation in the vocational program actually is what it was. So. Uh, so all these things, how much therapy they're getting, how much group they were attending, ex how, many, how many case management hours, I got all that information and it all came in the form of paper. <laughs> all these, these printed out sheets that had how many hours of this and that, that by client that everybody was, was using. So I had to go through and start to, to collate things. Um, I'm glad that I was paying attention in first grade when they were teaching me how to count. So, anyway. Well, what to do with all this information that I had, that I had just um, uh, received? Um, <clears throat> well, we, we, we had just gotten um, at the, the mental health center these desktop computers with Microsoft Excel on them. Now, I'd used VisiCalc, and you can see up there in the right-hand corner what VisiCalc looks like. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is it's installed on an old computer of mine. Um, a little screenshot there of that, isn't it cute? Um, uh, but that had something called Microsoft Excel. So Microsoft Excel was much more powerful than VisiCalc. Uh, and I was able to program Excel to execute uh, all these statistical formulas that I found in Ruben and Babby's research methods for social work first edition, which I have around someplace. I was looking for it. I was going to show you the cover of it. Um, keep your keep your textbooks. This is my textbooks lecture section. Keep those textbooks because they really are practice manuals. You know, I wouldn't have well, wouldn't have expected to be using um, uh, my research book uh, uh, in a clinical practice at a mental health center, but there I was having to use it. So. So what I did um, was basically do some basic calculation. I did some summary statistics, um, and this is me relying on memory. I wish I would have kept my report. I had, I had these these uh, transparencies. Remember, you have to remember transparencies back in the days, overhead projectors <laughs> um, that had this on it, but I don't have them anymore, um, which had summary statistics before and after. Uh, Essentially, what I probably did was a repeated measures t-test. You know, their 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 usage before and their usage after DBT. Uh, although um, um, it's it's hard to say. I I do recall uh, something about an analysis of variance, but I can't remember exactly uh, what I did at the time. But I do remember that there was statistically significant improvements in in and most importantly, vocational activity. Um, you know, people were either working or going to school at a much higher rate than they had before. Um, decreased levels of, of self-harm, uh, decreased hospitalizations, and um, uh, <clears throat> along with uh, increased use of, of respite care, which we viewed as a positive outcome. And, um, and we could clearly, clearly relate that um, um, I must have done some regressions because we could. I, I remember clearly relating it to to amount of of DBT that they were attending uh, significantly predicted each one of these things. And so, and plus we had all the anecdotal uh, accounts from uh, um, the staff about the the improvement in our working environment. Uh, not only because people were maybe trying to kill themselves a little less frequently than they had before. But the DBT had this this mechanism in, in, inside of it where where there was a lot of, of um, institutional and, and staff peer support. And so it was it was a it was it was a good program and uh, and essentially you know because of um, of um, of um, being able to 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 do these uh, statistical tests. Um, 
because I was able to uh, use readily available spreadsheet software and a basic research text, you know, th this whole program, which we valued quite a lot, uh, was saved from being scrapped. And it was going to be scrapped for a political reason. There's, there's no evidence that we were that we were lo charging, you know, that the money, mental health center was losing money on us because everything we were doing, you know, therapy, group, 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 um, um, uh, the vocational services, uh, uh, case management service, all these things that we were doing for the borderline personality client, was, we were able to charge Medicare, and Medicaid. So it's not like the mental health center wasn't getting reimbursed for everything we were doing. It was all political. Uh, <clears throat> And because my, 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 my social work education had been a clinical focus, it had not prepared me to evaluate the effectiveness of that program. So, you know, I, you know, again, second lecture, say those texts and remember what you're doing in your quantitative research class. Because bef before long, uh, and you know, this was, you know, this was, this was 1996, 97, something like that. I'd been there for three or four years. I got out, got my MSW in 92. So, you know, maybe three or four years after, after uh, I, uh, I'm out in practice, I essentially have to design and implement uh, a, a research model around this. So, uh, so again, my final lecture, do not throw away those textbooks, keep them and there may be a day when you use them. Besides, they don't give you anything for them anyway when, when, when you sell them back. So just save them. So your kids might like them. So anyway, that's all for today.